Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you can you hear us all right? Yes, yes, we hear you perfectly. Thank you. Wonderful. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, it's it's a real honor to be invited to speak uh, for this lecture series. Uh, we regret that we cannot be there in person, uh, but we are very happy to be there with you tonight and to share some of our work over the last, uh, we're looking back almost 10 years, um, and we'll be speaking for about 40, 45 minutes, um, and we're very happy to take some questions afterwards if there are any. Thanks again for inviting us. Great. Um, so we are going to cover um, three um, areas today, not necessarily in order, uh, but you can look for these topics as they, they will be intertwined throughout the lecture. Uh, these being uh, virtual cities, virtual mobility, and uh, virtual textiles. Uh, to give a little bit of an intro uh, to our practice, um, we do a lot of different uh, things. We really are multidisciplinary. Uh, we build buildings, or like we are architects in the more conventional sense of the word. Uh, we are very interested in uh, specifically in, in building systems that bring together craftsmanship and uh, industrial or prefabricated systems uh, together into the construction site. We also work with uh, interiors, uh, furniture, and at all scales also with uh, very large proposals for uh, big buildings uh, and even cities. But the side of our practice that uh, we are going to be talking about today is uh, the one that is uh, centered around uh, virtual experiences. Uh, these are usually in the form of research projects that lead to artworks, uh, but also projects for uh, with collaborators or clients. Um, we have been doing this kind of work uh, for over 10 years. And um, we started even in 2013, even before we had our first headset to, to think about virtual architecture. And then ever since we had been experimenting with different formats, different types of hardware, with basically different ways uh, of bringing media into architecture or uh, working with spatial media. One of our first works uh, was the glass chain, which is an example of what we are going, calling a spatial essay, which is basically a film that is experienced in virtual reality, a film that is spatial, and therefore is something in between theater and film. And um, uh, these have always several components that are uh, physical and virtual, very often uh, with a large object uh, that is a sort of sculpture or piece of furniture around which the story uh, develops. Within these films, we often find characters, uh, characters that uh, sometimes are talking to us or, as, or taking us through, through the story. And, and these characters may vary in scale, therefore completely changing the, your understanding of the, the pieces around you or the environment around you and, and, and shifting that scale. In uh, The Guardian Case, which was uh, also a virtual film produced in, uh, in 2019, for, uh, commissioned for the, the Royal Palace of Milan in Italy, uh, we developed a piece that reflected on the history of, uh, of media and the transportation of media. Uh, and this was located in the tapestry room uh, of the of the Royal Palace of Milan, and it precisely spoke about uh, this. Well, it reflected on uh, the tapestries and the history of the tapestry as a media object. Here we see the comparison of basically what you are seeing inside the the virtual film, what we call the spatial essay, uh, and we see there is a series of transformations to the object, uh, things that happen in and around and to the object, and. Um, also, we see a character on the right, this is what we're calling the, a sort of a guide, that is basically someone that is unfolding the different uh, arguments and ideas uh, around these issues and around our research in, uh, in virtual reality. We believe that the idea of media being spatial or uh, media being distributed through uh, space or even architecture is nothing entirely new. And in fact, that the tapestry itself is one of the uh, first examples 
of uh, media is basically a story that becomes portable and that can be deployed in, in space. So working with the story contained in these um, tapestries, we basically brought the characters out of the tapestry and brought them out into the room with you. And then the physical object itself was like a snapshot of uh, a moment in the virtual reality film, as we see a reflection of the room, but a reflection of the room that contains the virtual characters in it. And here we can see another view from what you would experience when you're wearing the, the VR headsets, where you can see here the characters kind of, they go from being included in the object and then standing there in the room, in the room with you. And here again, we see this guide standing in front of this marvelous um, 17th century French tapestry. And at the kind of core of our practice, um, we're really interested in, in media and the history of media and its relationship to architecture. And we've been doing over the past couple of years, a lot of research on the history of media. And uh, in 2020, just before the pandemic, we opened an exhibition in London called Freestyle Architectural Adventures in Mass Media, uh, which we are going to speak about a little bit more tonight, a little bit more in detail. And this exhibition, uh, in a nutshell, is about the relationship between mass media and style in architecture, specifically here, um, style in architecture in England or, or Britain. So before we speak more about this project and the exhibition, we'll speak a little bit about how it all started. So I'm sure many of you maybe um, recognize these very famous drawings in the 16th century book, um, on five styles of architecture by Sebastiano Serlio, um, which was the kind of starting point of this of this exhibition. Uh, and what is so remarkable about this book uh, is that it's not the first book on architecture in the in in Europe, but it's the first book on architecture that contained illustrations, which was uh, a remarkable revolution because it basically meant it was the first time you could transport visual information about buildings. Uh, without having to go and see them in person and we often refer to the to the writings of mario carpo um if, from his uh, book architecture in the age of printing where he writes buildings could not travel so people had to in the time before before the book um where essentially the book becomes a vehicle for buildings to travel in um so this was the starting point of this project and we'll just show you a little bit about the kind of internal process is like for for us when creating a project like this so the things that we looked at for this research which spanned for for about two years was we looked at mass media hardware so like the machines that makes media possible then mass media software so like the the specific books or specific photographs etc and then of course the architectural styles when they were popular and when they came to be then the architects when they were alive what they built if they own big libraries, et cetera, and then the buildings themselves. And then we build up um, large databases uh, like this in just a normal, very basic Excel sheets, but with a ton of information where we can cross reference um, all of the information that we showed you in the previous slide, leading up to an exhibition that looks like this. So you will see here in this picture that there's a large sculpture or a physical model uh, in the middle of the picture, standing on a digitally printed carpet uh, with uh, uh, collection objects from the RBA archives on the wall, as well as uh, VR headsets, where a film could be experienced split up in four different acts uh, in four different headsets. And like what the examples that Lara showed before, the experience is linked to the physical object um, that we see here in the center. And we'll explain just a little bit of how we how we design an exhibition like this. So we can see here a plan view where we can see the carpet. And essentially, the whole room is a diagram. So along the, along the, the central line of the model, we have time that goes from, um, from left to right. Um, so each year is represented by two centimeters in the carpet and becomes sort of the way that you navigate through the space. Then we have these splits in the carpet that indicates the rough estimation of when styles became popular and less popular. Indicates the time when they start, but not the time when they end. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 
And we can already see here clearly our hypothesis of the fact that media accelerates the change in style. We can see the styles here around our time shifting very quickly. And then we can also see in the carpet here um, some um, ornamental elements that when we look closely, we can recognize that um, according to where they are placed in the carpet, we can see mass media objects and machines, etc., that were necessary to create the media of the time. Uh, so if you're standing in front of the model um, here, um, then essentially what you might be seeing is something like this. So you can see that the model is still there, but all of the space around you keeps shifting in accordance with uh, the film playing. And we're now going to be describing um, no, um, a little bit of what these four different acts are about and what this story leads up to. So uh, starting with Act 1, which co covers really the beginning when the first books started arriving in, in, in Britain. And we can see here on the model, we can see Serlio's books lying there with a little guide there. So similar to the previous project, we have a guide here again that speaks to you throughout the film. And throughout this first film, we get introduced to important architectural events and architects in, in the UK, such as here, you might recognize St. Paul's Cathedral, which is designed by Sir Christopher Wren. And this is perhaps one of the most interesting early examples, because Sir Christopher Wren, he built over 50 churches in, this, in the city of London after the Great Fire of London. And uh, he built mainly in the Baroque style, which is a style that came really from France. And he only went to France once, uh, so, and, but he owned an enormous library, which means that in our view, he was really one of the first mass media driven architects because all of his designs basically came from books and etchings. Act two covers a very important period where more and more books starts to be translated into English, <clears throat> mainly from Italian at this point. And also um, these massive steps where we get introduced to and new technologies such as the camera and other forms of um, stereoscope, yeah, yeah, other forms of immersive media. <clears throat> and then Act Three covers the 20th century, where of course a lot happens in media and and style. We we get the television, and through the television we also get all of the spaces that we saw inside of the television and the style influences that came from that. Of course, leading up to um, moments such as when the video game gets introduced, when we can have uh, experiences in our homes of actually interacting with virtual environments. And leading up to, to a new way of thinking about architecture that slowly gets established with the, the evolution of video games, of thinking of, about architecture like a set, like a grammar almost, like individual word, words or sentences to create stories. And Act 4 covers our time and the future, where we speak about some of the things that we, are, we actually think has the biggest impact and are the most important media tools of today, such as Pinterest. Uh, we know that this is often, often a contentious uh, tool, especially within architecture, but we really think that it's one of the, the most revolutionary tools of our times. Mainly for this function, the fact that this is the first time when we can search for visual information with visual information, that you can click on more like this and you get an endless scroll, an endless feed of similar visual information. And really this is leading up to our sort of prediction, speculation that we quite strongly believe in, uh, is that by the middle of the 21st century, all media will be spatial. And for us, that means that by 2050, we will have no more smartphones or no more laptops, no more mo computer monitors um, as we use them in our daily lives today, but they will all be replaced by spatial media, which together with the evolution of AI, we think will lead to what we call the architect architecture at the speed of the spoken word, essentially that we can create fully believable three-dimensional environments um, at the speed that we can utter them, that we can communicate them. And this kind of concludes the presentation around this project. Now we're going to shift around a little bit. So besides working on um, on these sort of projects that are basically research projects that lead to um, speculative ideas of a near future, um, we have also been building platforms with the tools of today and, and for the needs of today. Uh, these are all, or like most of these are uh, web-based um, virtu virtual reality platforms. This means that you can access them just through a link to a website and you can access them from every device. 
all the way from uh, the simplest smartphone to, to a virtual reality headset. That means that you are bringing people together through various different means. And uh, while all of them are represented by an avatar, their experiences are quite different based on the hardware that they are accessing from, right? Whether it is a screen or a headset, and depending on what type of screen makes for a, quite a different type of experience. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we are very interested in uh, where things are at at this very moment. Uh, so together with uh, our students, our research group, we developed a report of the current state of uh, virtual gatherings uh, that is called distant crowds dot report where we try to answer uh, questions uh, of the kind of like what is even a virtual gathering what are the different kinds what do we do how do, does this work and what makes a virtual gathering good and this comes from uh, also like our experiences building these worlds in uh, autumn of uh, 2020 we had our first uh, larger commission for a, a virtual conference, uh, designing the setting for a virtual conference for the foundation, Spanish foundation Arquia Proxima, which um, every year has a, a cultural program where uh, people comes together like this. Uh, there is a series of lectures, um, but uh, what is most important besides attending to, to the program basically the networking and, and the connections that people create when they attend this. It is attended by uh, a lot of young architects as they are awarding grants and awards uh, to, to young practices and also to recent graduates. So it is a very important moment when a whole generation sort of comes together. Uh, that year they had planned for this event to be in Barcelona, so they asked us to, um, to develop something that in some way resembled um, the, the city of Barcelona. Instead of looking at the image, we looked at the very famous uh, urban plan, the Plan Cerda. Uh, and we used Plan Cerda in order to create what is called a non-Euclidean space. A non-Euclidean space is basically a space that would be physically impossible because it is in some way folding or overlapping with itself. So uh, the space is composed of uh, just nine uh, different rooms or sort of city blocks. Uh, however, because of the way in which we organize the connections between these spaces, basically the portals from one room to another, it gives you this sense of um, endlessness. There are uh, a lot of different types of uh, rooms because uh, well, the program is composed of uh, both the events themselves, but also uh, a lot of material that is being exhibited. Uh, projects, this year they also had commissioned a documentary uh, that had uh, interviews with uh, a lot of different ar architects from Spain and Portugal, and um, and also projects that were exhibited for uh, an award that was given um, at the end of the of the conference. These spaces are designed so that you can encounter this uh, basically like two D content in a way that it fills your whole screen, uh, right? So it's designed in a way for the proportions of the screen. And um, it's designed in a way in which you are, in a way, like walking into the screen, right? Like walking through it. Um, and the same goes for spaces like this. Uh, here is, well, inside, if you walk into this space, is where the, um, the, uh, the documentary that, that, that they were showcasing is, uh, is being displayed. So even though it's an interesting space to walk around, and at the, on the top floor you had this photography exhibition, uh, you could walk in and then basically like look at that film in a way in which it makes sense for for someone who's accessing from a screen. And at the same time, designing these spaces to, to as well sort of get lost in uh, and uh, bump into people and, and explore together with, uh, with friends or people you've just met. At the core, what is most important is, uh, well, this is the arena, which is the central space where uh, there were uh, all the talks and lectures were being projected or they were being held there in that room. And um, what's very important about this is uh, how people gathered together uh, and they, that they were represented by avatars and that there was the feature of spatial audio. Spatial audio means that you can talk to the person next to you um, and your audio gets lower and lower uh, in the distance. 
just like in real life. So that means that you can talk to the person next to you without disturbing everybody else. Unlike in a Zoom call where every time somebody speaks, we have the exact same volume for everybody in the call and therefore it's only one person at a time. Uh, in this case, having special audio, we, we create a, a, <clears throat> a sense of togetherness uh, and a, a possibility for interacting that is much more natural and much more intimate. However, it was a very strange uh, moment for us to have to design the way people looked uh, in our spaces, right? And this is something that then we, we started to think about and also um, well, that, that, that uh, was part of our research as well, as well at, at that moment. Here is the way that avatars look. In this case, it was the two of us, but in a sense, it could have been anybody, right? Because you could pick from a series of avatars. The reason why we had to design them in this way is that they needed to be very simple so that it could run in basically any type of hardware. So they needed to be very lightweight, computationally speaking. But this is something that we see commonly in uh, as if we use uh, different types of, uh, of virtual reality platforms. In each of them, you basically have a version of yourselves. And as you see here, these are different versions uh, of Frederick in, in different um, in, uh, social VR platforms, what people is now calling metaverse platforms, but that existed uh, a few years back. Uh, and they are more generally called social VR, social virtual reality. And uh, there is many different ones at the moment, and you cannot really cross over between them. We wanted to, with, I mean, you cannot bring your identity across them. You are going to be a different version of yourself in each one of them. We wanted to highlight specifically one of them that we choose to work with, uh, with uh, the Mozilla Hubs uh, platform. Uh, the Mozilla Foundation has a pledge for a healthy internet uh, and it's completely open source. Uh, it also that also means that uh, every time you create a world is owned and managed by you and that sort of decentralizes the the moderation of the platform and as well uh, you can use their open source stack to create your own and that literally decentralizes even the 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 server hosting of such platforms creating a true immersive internet or maybe creating a true metaverse as people is calling it today which is not owned by one simple um, plat one single platform uh, we wanted to quote here Jaron Lanier in his text uh, why is the city square square where he talks about that um, every, almost everyone that has a presence online has chosen to do so by a contract with a big corporation and this is in connection with what I was just talking about with uh, basically like the necessity to bring this out of the single platform model and instead have a plurality of, um, of the management of these platforms. And uh, we have probably seen a lot about uh, metaverse platforms and, and, and the whole noise that meta has been making. We think actually like using the word metaverse is part of the problem. Um, it has a past in, in sci-fi and particularly in very dystopian views of sci-fi, but it also, the idea of calling it metaverse is in our sense a way to make it into a product that someone could own or someone could say, as meta is saying, we are going to build a metaverse. We don't think the metaverse needs to be built from scratch. We think it's just an iteration of the existing internet that is made into a three dimension of it. It's given a new dimension, no? it's now three dimensional and we can experience it through immersive media. So we prefer to refer to it just as the immersive internet. There has been really quite terrible attempts uh, at uh, capitalizing on these ideas of what people is calling the metaverse for that very reason. We see platforms uh, being built, these are maps of Decentraland. Uh, so platforms be being built uh, where people is trying to sell uh, virtual real estate in platforms where there isn't even a community, right? So a market, uh, and a speculative market based on the real estate market and all its problems is uh, trying to be recreated by means of artificial scarcity in virtual space. And, and we think this is really not the way to go at all. Instead, we think that what is interesting is to look at the wide variety of experiences and platforms available already today. Here is a, a list compiled by Ryan Schultz um, of uh, social VR platforms um, that are all uh, already existent and, 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 and operational. 
And we think that the interesting question or this, the interesting issue and the better way to think about the city uh, or the virtual city or how we're going or virtual infrastructure is uh, basically to think about it as the connections uh, between these. For this, uh, we have been thinking a lot about the way in which we cross worlds or we teleport virtually. And that is, um, well, the, the, the more direct reference that we have or the most common reference we have is uh, through portals, portals through other worlds. And um, there's something we've been working on in many different projects. Um, and this interest of, of the question of what does it mean to move from one virtual space to another. Um, we've been exploring this in, in many different ways. Here's a cover we designed for Metropolis magazine where we can see a kind of textile portal opening up, which we'll speak a bit more about later on. And here is a screenshot from a film. And here is an artwork we created imagining a portal from public to private space out in the uh, in a public environment. And we've had a chance to explore this in many different ways. Um, here is uh, a photograph from a video installation that we had a chance to install uh, in Seoul at Doksugung Palace. Uh, it's a large LED screen which sits right in the main entrance in this gate um, leading into what was at the time the emperor's private be bedchamber. And the film that we produced for specifically for this place sort of imagines this um, exciting but confusing moment when we are using media mainly as two-dimensional interfaces, but in a sense, we do actually enter them. So we created this film of an endless amount of doors that open up and are kind of visually referencing uh, different forms of media, uh, specifically in South Korea, going back to the introduction of television. And this actually links to, to a project that we finished just last year that's going to be shown again in, in Vienna this summer, which is about portals and their history. And we actually believe that the, the portal, as we might recognize it from here, from a famous anime movie, will serve as the everyday means of transportation uh, in the coming decades, as more and more of our interaction uh, is done in virtual <laughs> environments. So I'm sure some of you will recognize some of these um, absolute classics, um, films and series and games that all include in one way or another an architectural element like a portal is what we're calling it, um, that can transport a person from one uh, either space to another different time or different dimensions. Um, here are some images that we produced for this project where we can we started to really look at these portals as individual architectural elements. So like, what do they look like? How big are they? How do you enter them, et cetera? And building up an archive of almost a thousand portals where we start to categorize them uh, in both in the practical terms of which media were they released on, what year, but also how do you access them? Who can access them? Do you need a key? Do you need training, et cetera? Um, and we created a, a way to represent this through these sort of medallions or these coins, each one for one portal where we can see the name and the release date, et cetera, and what kind of media they were released in, uh, and arranged them um, like this in a sort of time-based map, similar to the freestyle project that we showed earlier, where um, time goes from the center of the surface here and outwards. Um, and we also, through our research with this project, established that in portal history, we can find 18 distinct portal archetypes that are organized here with one sort of um, color area here per, per archetype. And you can see here the timeline running from 1950s out to 2020. This was uh, exhibited at the Sir John Stone Museum in the form of a large table. And this table, um, you could interact with and touch and look at, but you could also then see an immersive film uh, describing this research I've been doing of a history of portals through a virtual reality headset. And um, we will wrap up the talk here this, this evening with the question of what should virtual portals be like? You know, we've done a lot of research about this, and uh, given the fact that we believe that portals will become extremely important as infrastructure in the future. Uh, we have 
among other things, written a manifesto or a series of propositions um, that outlines what we think is the most important qualities when we think about hopefully the civic or public teleportation infrastructure of the future virtual environments. So some of these are, for example, uh, that we think it should be uh, shared, um, like uh, basically it should be decentralized in a sense, but it should also be shared and interoperable across many different, uh, well, across everybody. Um, that it should be readable. Uh, this is usually a, a, a very uh, contentious issue, uh, especially around uh, architects. The fact that uh, we build our virtual worlds to be highly referential, because we think they need to be legible and they need to be relatable. Um, we think it also will need to be efficient and affordable, so basically cheap, uh, computationally speaking, because uh, it will need to run very fluently. Uh, and we also uh, think that it needs to be civic, uh, in the sense that it needs to be considered public infrastructure or a communal infrastructure. And this, of course, poses a very complicated question when we're talking about something like the Internet uh, that is basically operated across borders. Uh, lastly, maybe to point out that we believe it uh, should be woven uh, and that therefore it should be made of things that are fabric-like. In our work, uh, we have actually worked quite a lot with uh, textiles and we are very interested in both their properties uh, to basically define a space without necessarily uh, enclosing it with a hard shell. Uh, it gives you a sense that there is something to explore behind or that there is uh, light or another, a larger space um, outside of it. And therefore it kind of expands spaces. It can also be printed and therefore contain environments within it uh, or very fluently create um, a, a connection between environments. And here are um, some uh, uh, photographs from uh, our show at uh, the ARCDES, uh, the Architecture and Design uh, Mu National Museum of uh, in, in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, and uh, yeah, we have experimented quite a lot with different types of prints and different types of things that can be contained um, within fabrics. Uh, and here we go back to the image that Frederick was showing before, where uh, space basically dissolves into something that is fabric-like and that opens up to a space beyond it. So we made this uh, proposal for basically like the infrastructure of, uh, of teleportation across the immersive internet in which uh, you would just reach out your hands and basically open up your picture plane as if it was a piece of fabric and cross it into another space. Um, this uh, not only would create a, a very inviting and smooth way of uh, crossing into other spaces, but also the fabric itself could contain information in its weave and in its texture. And we, of course, reference the work of, uh, of René Magritte here, who, had done, who has done a lot of incredible uh, uh, optic, well, sort of paintings that portray illusions, uh, including textiles. This was at the core of uh, one of our latest pieces, that was a commission from the Maxim Museum in Rome called Search History, uh, which was shown there uh, in, on, in December and January from last year and this year, um, which was uh, a piece that explored or like that presented a prototype for a teleportation across uh, the immersive internet, and at the same time also reflected on the theories of, uh, um, of the urban theories of Aldo Rossi, uh, which we believe are quite applicable uh, to notions of uh, virtual space. Here we can see uh, the piece uh, itself was a, a physical uh, layered sculpture of many, many layers of, um, of fabrics that rotated and moved around. And here we can see the piece in motion. So basically these different uh, hangings, fabric hangings, uh, were dynamically like shifting and creating different configurations, showing in a sense uh, the many different um, versions of a space that we can experience in virtual environments. In the in inside of the piece, 
uh, there was a, a sort of representation of a virtual space that is sort of layered that had many portals in it, in a sense, um, representing the your search history or like the many times you might have been in a space itself. And, and, and here we can see a detail of, of that. And for us also, these images from this project kind of, in a way, really concludes and wraps up a lot of the work that we have been doing um, over the last couple of years with this interest really of virtual space and how it might evolve over the next decades. And learning again here from, from past masters like Aldo Rossi, really with a hope that virtual environments of the future may carry all of the the potential as we can see here like one single view leading into a myriad of different worlds but somehow remaining um within our perhaps existing idea of what public or civic space is where um spaces are not owned by large corporations uh, and controlled by 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 commercial interest only but where we can imagine a a brighter future um for all of us. And with that, we thank you so much for coming tonight. It's an honor to have been able to present our work in this lecture series, and we're very happy to, to take some questions if there are any. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Lara and Frederick. It was really inspiring to to listen to you, and uh, it really, really exceeded my expectations. Uh, absolutely, with with the political dimension, especially with the uh, mention of uh, 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 having an urge to to create a public space, a uh, space which is accessible, interoperable, and yeah, this is super important, I think, to hear for everybody these days. And uh, uh, just before we jump into the questions for the audience, uh, I would like to ask you to comment a little bit maybe on the book you recommended about Fabric of Civilization, if there is anything to add, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that was a very nice uh, addition in, in your lecture series that you asked your your talk, speakers to to recommend the book, and we recommended a book called The Fabric um, of Civilization, which is a book that looks at the the history of the textile industry and the history of the, the role of textiles um, in basically every culture in the world. And this links to, it's a very well-written book and it goes through a lot of very important and interesting moments throughout history. Um, and it for us kind of highlights the, the importance of, um, potentially the importance of, of fabrics also in the virtual environment. Because there, there are few elements or few materials that we interact with as much as textiles. Um, we might consider other material, but really, you know, textiles is basically a material that touches our body all of the time, you know, 24 hours a day. Uh, Covers our furniture, everything now is like all around us. Yeah, and it has built empires. It has um, been the cornerstone of, of entire world economies. Um, and we know very intrinsically how textiles behave when we touch them, which is, we think, also why potentially it's so interesting and relevant to to bring also this quality into to the virtual environment. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are there any uh, questions or follow-ups from the audience right now? So uh, the, the audience is a little bit shy. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is it's typical in, in our lands. So um, I might start a bit. Uh, with a question which I really uh, care of personally is about the um, the state of the architecture in general in virtuality. Uh, what do I mean? I mean, in uh, architecture, as we have uh, uh, been learning, most of us who are uh, architects is uh, basically born out of uh, various necessities and ergonomics. Uh, it has to provide shelter, it has to provide uh, warmth and comfort. And when it all moves to virtuality, most of those reasons are just gone. 
They are not valid reasoning anymore to create similar uh, shapes of objects. But uh, we still use them a lot. Of course, it, it is obvious that we have to find uh, comfort in recognizing uh, uh, the functions of spaces, uh, maybe code some behavioral things. But uh, how do you see this? Are we Will we eventually shift to, to other reasonings in the virtual architecture beyond all that uh, has um, formed uh, and shaped our, our uh, physical architecture before? Uh, it's a very interesting and, and, and big question. Um, I guess in your question, there's both the question of the role of the architect or of architecture and um, this notion of, of what qualities remain when, when spaces are virtual. And it's something that we explored a little bit in, in the exhibi exhibition we spoke about, uh, not so much today, but value in the virtual, where we were thinking about what qualities of physical architecture also applies to, um, to virtual architecture. And many of them, like location or scale and size, etc., they don't really apply because um, size in the virtual environment or location, it's, it, it doesn't really exist in the same way um, yeah, in virtual architecture. But many qualities do, and many of the most obvious ones being like things like aesthetics and meaning and symbolism, etc. They obviously apply just as much to virtual and physical architecture. And also something that's very easy to forget um, is the, the resources, both the human resources in creating it um, and also, also the resources that are required to run it, essentially. You know, like a virtual building still requires real electricity to exist. Um, and the same, not in the same way, but, but connected to, to the requirement of physical architecture. But having said that, like, we think that maybe one of the most important things we mentioned very briefly as part of our manifesto that we wrote uh, is that in order for virtual architecture to have any meaning or to be usable by anyone, it needs to be relatable. It needs to be referential and symbolic to the physical world that we already know how to use and how to share. Many people might think that, okay, if, if virtual architecture doesn't need to, to have gravity, et cetera, it can look like anything, it can be completely abstract, it can be a completely new world. And this is where we definitely think that it cannot be a com completely new world. Because if, if you imagine a virtual environment that is completely abstract, you don't recognize anything. It's just a swirling cloud of colors, potentially. Uh, we wouldn't know how to share a space like that, how to use it, how to interact with it. Um, and a virtual environment, in, in many ways, is just a, a world full of language where that language needs to communicate to us in a way that we understand how we can share it and how we can use it. So it's a simple thing like a staircase. You know, We don't need staircases in virtual environments, but they communicate important points about how we can share and use that environment. Like there is a space like higher up that you can reach by going on the staircase. So we can also sit on staircases. Uh, we have uh, social codes around uh, you know, not standing in the middle of a staircase. There's also roles of furniture, for instance, the importance of, of chairs in virtual environments. You know, by sitting on a chair, we communicate that I am not going to leave immediately. And all of the, the, the linguistic and semiotic codes around how we use architecture, we think should really be mirrored um, to a large degree in virtual environments, maybe to the disappointment of a lot of people who expect virtual environments to be extremely new and novel. We think that it's more important that they are meaningful and referential to people so they can actually be used for, for something and not just looked at. Um, and of course, this is a quality that the architect uh, knows a lot about ideally and can help to make a, a useful and meaningful transition from the physical world to the virtual world. Anyone is joining? Yes, Pavelos is joining us. So I will be the shaky cameraman for you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thanks uh, for, for the lecture. I have a few questions. So just to begin, uh, one question would be, you are both uh, educated as architects, but increasingly interested in the virtual lands and, and, and all sorts of things virtual. That's not so common in 
in this field. So maybe you could a little bit elaborate on, on what was uh, the road you took and, and why you chose uh, virtuality as one of your interest subjects. So, so that's one part of the question. And another one is um, the style. Uh, you have quite a, a different style of, uh, of, of your works. And uh, I wonder how, how did you came up to it and uh, what kind of influences you could mention in, in, in your way to, to who you are right now? Yeah, <clears throat> well, thank you. Um, I think if we are to talk about why, how we became interested in uh, developing, or like in working with um, <clears throat> with <clears throat> with virtual media, um, or basically working with media, I think uh, has to do with maybe with two um, aspects. One was well the emergence of um, immersive media made it very interesting for us to, as we realized that if uh, anything that we knew that was we were experiencing two-dimensionally on the screen. Everything was designed based on the on the tradition of basically how we design things on paper. No, everything on websites and so on is inheriting from layouts of books, from graphic design, from the world of graphics, uh, and so on. The moment that you basically get to step into the screen, you completely break all those rules. No, you might have still like a bit of an interface that borrows from the t traditions of 2D, the tradition of paper. But the moment you enter the screen, then everything you are arranging needs to borrow from the tradition of architecture no? and the knowledge of, uh, of an architect. So we thought that posed a very interesting uh, challenge and a, a whole new avenue for architectural design uh, and a new realm for for architects to uh to practice uh in uh, we think that that is really really uh, exciting and i mean a very good example of that is even the notion of the portal no we're creating this archive basically like writing the history of the portal uh, that exists currently just in fiction basically um because the reason why we're creating that is because suddenly there is this very important element that is replacing what before was a 2d element which was just like a button with a hyperlink no or even a piece of text that you click on and then there is no transition you just turn from one page to another um however when you are turning from one page to an, from one space to another it would be incredibly disorienting to not have a threshold and the link becomes three-dimensional in the form of a portal or of some kind of threshold. Right? So that is one example of how basically when you enter the screen and media becomes spatial, it will require um, spatial thinking. And, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why we became so interested. On the other hand, we or like an, another aspect uh, for our interests that is something that we developed also in even our first proposal for for a virtual platform um, is also the notion of uh, basically like encapsulating large amounts of data in in a spatial way basically like the possibility to inhabit diagrams you know that we showed in some of our projects like freestyle or even the portal galleries you know you always have this diagram where you can look at a lot of information. We think that a lot of the current problems of uh, the things we know at the moment, or like how we navigate uh, large databases at the moment, has to do with the fact that the internet really expands our ability to have ac our access to information, but our capacity to absorb that does not expand that same uh, pace and therefore we are always looking at diagrams or representations of information that are of course subjective and um, but we very rarely look at the whole because you just get lost in it right so we think that it's very interesting to start thinking about these databases instead of like something that needs to be brought down to a very simple diagram that you can absorb very quickly instead to think about them as libraries three-dimensional libraries that we can roam and where we can randomly pick up things and look at them so we can engage with things at the level of detail 
that uh, we are like you would engage with one book in a library with a million books. But at the same time, you would be roaming that library of a million books and maybe like access other books that are next to it. And therefore, like basically make your own, uh, create your own understanding of um, of these large sets of information. So these two things, mm. the basically like media becomes spatial and therefore is architectural and the possibility of creating a, an architecture for data or creating data libraries that are experienced and designed from <clears throat> from the point of view of an architect basically designing a library. And our our interest really, I mean, it comes from before we had access to headsets when we were students doing projects, speculating on what spaces of imagination or, or even, you know, non-digital environments at all, but just spaces that have the possibility to change the way the virtual environments can something that we've been sort of basing everything on. But then in the, your second question about style, um, I think through our research and thinking about style of spaces or styles of architecture with thinking about and working with virtual environments, you know, style for architects is often something very, very sort of, it's a contentious question because if you have a chance to build a building you know, the amount of resources and work required to create a physical building, you know, it's extraordinary. It's one of the most you know, energy and resource and labor consuming things that humans create. So what it's going to look like is very important. And us architects, we're very trained to think about the choice of style is so sensitive that it's bec it becomes political. Often with architects, you might, someone who is very, very strictly a modernist, for instance, might even get upset by other seeing other styles. and. Well, or more likely there is the claim that there is no style and mm. that everything comes from yeah, yeah. Uh, very logical responses to context mm. or to the program or to the available resources, which is fair enough. However, there are always decisions being made, you know, so, stylistic decisions being made at some point. So working on this research project, but also designing things for virtual environments, we I think we, we think much more about style like it's just part of of an expression of uh, something that you're saying in the moment, like virtual architecture can change styles the way that you change mood of a, of a party almost. You know, it's, it's, it's an interaction of a completely different, different level, uh, which is also why we, maybe why we use a lot of colors because we you know, see colors as one of the primary you know, qualities of the human experience is to, and to leave out color in our view is, is like a musician not playing certain notes. You know, it's it's just a huge part of the way we perceive the world. So it's also for us an important uh, part of of uh, the way people would experience something that we that we design, yeah. which means that we also see colors and something not as a style that we establish that like this is the style we have, but style has to be uh, reappropriated to every every situation. Um, and those situations are, of course, much more fleeting yeah. in virtual environments where we can design an entire city for one event. You know, we don't need to think about, okay, this building is going to stand for 50 years, etc. Which, of course, is different when we have the chances to design actual physical environments. We employ a very different thinking then, of course, and sense of responsibility than we do with virtual architecture. And in general, we're very keen on... Uh polychromy, ornamentation. We're very interested in the expressive uh, qualities of architecture. So we very often look at, uh, at historical architecture um, and uh, decorative styles of, uh, of all places. We have been very interested, in, but we spent a lot of time living in, in Thailand. Uh, so in general, we have been very uh, like excited by uh, uh, Southeast Asian uh, traditional um, architecture, things like the uh, Korean, Dan South Korean Danchung style. Um, we are always uh, really drawn towards things like that. Mm. So, thanks. Uh, and just one more question. Uh, I see that uh, you produce uh, so many projects, and uh, I wonder if you could. Uh, Tell us about your uh, whether you are creating everything by your own, or all, all of the 3D and 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 all of the prints and everything, or do you have 
maybe some collaborations with uh, programmers, 3D modelers, or other professionals, because you seem quite fluent in all of the web-based programs and, and other media and digital media, and uh, just wondering about uh, the collaborations with other professionals, or especially in, in, in the IT and, and technological knowledge. Yeah, we, um, <clears throat> we mainly, I mean, we like to make things ourselves. That is the reason also why uh, we haven't grown the practice uh, in the more traditional sense of having like a lot of uh, employees and other things. We would like to do things ourselves. So it's mainly all done by the, by the two of us. Um, for the WebXR uh, projects, where there are things that we cannot get to with coding and things like that, uh, there is usually uh, a programmer, that uh, a creative technologist that we collaborate with on the on the technical aspects. It's basically coding. Um, we are we would love to be able to do all of that ourselves, but uh, we aren't yet. Although we think that is maybe like one of them. A very important skill uh, to probably train oneself uh, with. Uh, everything else is mostly done by us, uh, and we like to collaborate with people that has very different skills to us. Um, so yeah, usually like create, creative technologists. Um, we also sometimes uh, for research projects have a research assistant, someone who can help us plow through through their research, but also bring their own perspective and someone that we can bounce off ideas uh, with. And uh, now that we didn't talk about it today, but we have also started to experiment with um, events that are more like uh, or like experiencing virtual spaces through a sort of live performances where we take you through a virtual space in the moment. We, uh, we are starting to uh, collaborate with people such as performers uh, as well. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Oh, yeah. This audience is awake. <laughs> Thank you so much for a very inspiring, you know, uh, presentation. And uh, for me, it's a very interesting uh, moment. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, about uh, the changes uh, of um, about the moment uh, 2050, yes, you mentioned about the changes uh, when our uh, 2D monitors, whatever size it is, will be moved outside and we, we won't use it. So how do you see how the architecture will change? Because we live in the environment and I suppose that uh, we need to think about those uh, spaces how to adapt them for, for this uh, issue. So do you have any ideas? I suppose that you have. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, very interesting question. Um, and this speculation, by the way, it's, it's based on us following the, the world of uh, immersive media technology, what all of these big companies are, are basically doing. And um, many of them are planning for the phasing out of things like the smartphone. And basically, just so that it's cleared what the speculation involves is that we think that basically all media will be, maybe not 100% of media, but the personal media we use every day will be basically coming to us through filters that we have over our eyes. At the moment, it's extremely complex, politically complex, because these things will require cameras, etc. But we assume that this will somehow find a solution within the next couple of decades. And of course, the entire world, uh, as we know it today, is built around the screen, but that what predates that is built around the paper, so the sort of clerical desk setup, and all of these, these kind of ways that our society is grounded in the way we use screens and paper. But we think perhaps that it's not, it's not as, as built in as we might think. I think that in part, probably everything is going to switch to um, through, to glasses, uh, maybe sooner than we think. However, as it happened with the computer, we will bring a lot of the stuff we know with us. No, when 
in computers, we still have folders that contain files and they even look like that until you open them, right? We have many folders and things like the agenda looks like an agenda. So we will probably bring the format of the screen with us, even though we will have no physical device. Um, no, now we find ourselves in the office with like 25 screens. And it's literally, we are screaming for basically like bigger screens or be able to, to have a, basically a much larger workspace. Um, but I think maybe we will in the beginning be holding virtual, uh, virtual screens or be looking at virtual screens uh, quite a lot, even if it's through our glasses before we start basically like taking away the screen and media is architecture. Um, the, the interesting thing about this is that once you are wearing glasses, any object can be a, a smart object, no? Any object can, can be the container of other things or any object can be something that you interact with. And we have, we have written a little bit about um, what some of the most difficult things will be in order to, to sort of make this happen in, in relationship to architecture and space. And the term often used to describe these VR headset and AR headset is the amount of degrees of freedom that they have. So the headsets that are available now, they have six degrees of freedom, which means that they can spin in all directions and they can also move around in space. Um, and we have spoken about the what would be, in this case, in relation to, to this question, which will be even more relevant is what we're calling the seventh degree of freedom, which is the limitation of how we how we use space and the fact that if this, the screens, basically all media is spatial, so it means that it can be all around us, then the limitation maybe is not the fact that we have desks and the world is surrounding around you know, the, the shape of paper and screens, but the fact that um, we're not trained to, to interact with, uh, or the society is not built around interacting with media, um, spatial media in public space. You know, you have essentially you know, a domain, a private domain in which you watch your films and you interact with your screens and your work, etc. We think that in order for this to really reach an, another level, we will need to rethink the political use of space and, and in which spaces is it okay to use a private um, yeah. virtual environment? Like if you're in a park or if you're in a city square or something and you are moving your body around interacting with the virtual environment that maybe only you see and if you only you see it then how are we considering the sharing of public space um so i think apart from from this practical issue i think we'll be very happy to get rid of of desks i think they will happen quicker than we think like offices might just get rid of them if that's if that's a sort of logical step which but, is happening already which happening already yeah but the more difficult thing is the political aspect of how both how we think about privacy and uh, data gathering etc but also the political issues of how we consider the way we actually use space and what is acceptable an acceptable use yeah. of the spaces that we that we share and this is something in, that is very difficult to predict and that we, we in, i mean you know. we can see traces of this already happening with uh, what the internet and laptops have enabled <clears throat> the fact that you can go with your laptop to a cafe and basically have your entire work day in that space which is mm, mm, it's a public space but privately managed <clears throat> so it's like what kind of uh, do you have the right to use that space in that sense so this with the if we then even like expand the screen and we can take up a lot more space with our own little device in what we consider public spaces uh, will create even more of a challenge to the compartmentalization of like private versus public space and what we expect people to be allowed to do and where right this association of um, activity or like functions to spaces I think it's going to be more and more challenged by the freedom of uh, that the spatial media could, uh, could enable. Uh, you, <clears throat> just adding one last point to this uh, very interesting <laughs> question is that we, we think that maybe a, a bigger barrier than a technical one is again the, the, the political. Polit political one and the fact that if it continues the way it does today that that smartphones and leading on AR glass, et cetera, are just products. They're just commercial products. You can choose to buy them or not. 
um, we do not think that this will will work. We we assume that there will be um, a gradual increase of involvement from from nation states um, and the, and governments, which will not you know, come without problems. Um, but essentially, you know, we will need to consider these somehow a civic infrastructure, a public infrastructure, <laughs> and not something that just you know people can choose to have a smartphone or not, um, because these devices. Again, they require you to record the environment and that information, then you know, you're basically looking at other people and involuntarily maybe recording them. So we both think and hope that the future of this will look more like you know, the way that pay phones looked like um, yeah. you know, in, in a previous time where like the, the state provides telephones scattered around the entire country where if you need to call someone, you know, pay phones usually cost money, but you put in a quarter or something, you can make a phone call. Uh, we need to see somehow much more complex, but a similar form of public or, or civic engagement with providing this infrastructure for it to really be possible. Otherwise, the, the conflicts will be too strong with, you know, your neighboring civ uh, fellow citizens experiencing vastly different realities than you, which will come with uh, just too many problems. So, yeah. Thank you. A very interesting question. <laughs> a long answer. I hope that answers it. And no one else? Yes. Um, hi there. Um, Laura and Frederick, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, I have a, so I'm not sure where, where to look, so I'm looking to discuss. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a question about the portals. Uh, it was really impressive to learn that, that you have built the um, actual database of uh, portals and you gathered lots of data about it. And I'm re really curious whether you have gained or learned anything uh, like any, have you noticed any trends? Uh, mm, for yes. example, um, so uh, like uh, I have seen several portals in my life, like uh, like uh, Rick and Morty's or like in, in movies, etc. So. Um, most common shapes that I have seen, uh, it's like squares uh, or like circular portals. Like squares probably comes from, you know, doors or gates or, or something like that. So I'm not sure where circular comes from, but it just looks good, right? And um, I'm just interested whether there are any connections um, between the shape of the portal and then what it actually does. For example, is there a link between, you know, circular yeah. portals making you travel through time and then... Uh, square portals making you travel through space and um yeah and any other interesting patterns that you have seen in portals thank you yeah. that's super super interesting great uh, speculation there on on the role of different shapes and portals and perhaps we can shed some light on yeah so i mean i wish you could uh, we could show you the films because they are precisely about this um there is the 18 archetypes that we developed in which we have a lot of rings we even have subcategories for things that are ring shaped light like some are just made of energy and you just cross them some are actual machinery uh, that you go into some are like spiraling you in but then there are a lot of Um, other archetypes that this, I mean, we were looking following portal types, like these archetypes when they emerge, like which one is the first one and how they develop from that first one. They then basically like start to appear in sequels. Uh, I mean, like somewhere the level came in emerge that when other versions of that story is it a movie or maybe goes from a comic to then be a movie, and that's very interesting to see. Um, but perhaps the, the key aspect was to see the the themes or, or like the spirit of the stories according to time. So we see portals, for example, in the 1950s. And or even earlier, earlier than that, the, the, like the earlier portals, like the ones we saw in Alice in Wonderland, etc., cetera, et cetera, like 19th century portals, or early 20th century portals often involves uh, portals that are 
potentially portals that leads to dream worlds. So it's not sure if the character is dreaming or if it's a fantasy world, if it's an actual place, which we think relates to the fact that the church was still quite strong, especially in, in, in Europe and controlling to some degree what types of stories could be written. And if they involved magic in some way, they were often not saying like there is a parallel universe or a parallel fantasy world and it exists, but you know, often revolving around the experience of children also, uh, where their experience could potentially be questioned. But then later on, after mainly the Second World War, we see really when portals really explode in, in popular culture. So this is the moment of like promoting post World War Two. We're all going to collaborate, and we're going to build these infrastructures to make sure this never happens again. And uh, then portals reflect that idea of this like everybody coming together to build these enormous infrastructures. It's also like a, a time of like building large uh, infrastructural projects. No, so this like very resource heavy uh, kind of things. Then you see towards the late 70s and 80s uh, portals that are very simple, quite brilliantly designed, brought to uh, very simple means, but that serve more as a sort of joke. Uh, so a very postmodern approach uh, to portals at that time, uh, where they are just like basically used for uh, quite like, funny purposes. Uh, like like the, the telephone booth from Bill and Ted or the DeLorean car from Back to the Future. But then also a lot of like body horror, such as like uh, the the t television in in David Cronenberg's Videodrome, um, and this sort of general kind of cultural critique around around that time, and then that is then largely followed by a period that we think that we are slowly getting out of right now. And this is generalizing. There are portals that overlap and that come again of different forms and different types. But generally, starting in the middle or late nineties. Um, we see an era of portals that are really about separation of groups of people. About exclusivity. Yeah, Ex the separation of like class, even ethne eth ethnicity. Uh, and this is really exemplified by the portals that we see in Harry Potter. Harry Potter is full of portals. And many of them are about acquiring power or about getting access, gaining access to something. and Or being the chosen one who has the key to yeah, enter that. Yeah. And in, in, our, in our view, really, like the, the most famous portal from, from Harry Potter, the nine and three quarters brick portal, and the train station that leads to the train that leads to this elitist school is such an extreme example because not only do you need to know that you can use the portal, but and you cannot learn how to use it. You need to be born in the correct family in order to use it. And if you're not, then you will simply... The only way to find out is like to smack your face onto a wall. Yeah, no, like it's... literally <laughs> facing the fact you that you don't have access to this world, or to this privilege and this power. So it's, first of all, yeah. a very bad portal because you just, if you're the chosen one, you cross through. And then what it communicates or like the way it operates is quite... Uh, Terrible. No? So yeah. we see a lot of portals in our time that are about that, which seems like, why would we be so interested in this? But mm. maybe it's a way also of dealing with uh, issues of, of uh, our time, uh, which is maybe interesting. At the same time, we also see portals that are using very, very casual ways, like Doctor Strange opens a ring to just pick up a book. No, mm. it's like... But still within the realm of, of portals being an exclusive tool, like something that yeah. you can learn, but if you're extremely smart, if you have the right access... And then if you're yeah. a chosen person, you can use it as a day-to-day -day yeah. thing. But how this relates to your specific question of form and, and shape, I think that actually this is an area that we haven't really studied in detail but we can see that for instance the ring or the the sort of circular portal seems to come from both early machine portals from the 50s and 60s what i think comes from the sort of imagery that we saw of machines of nuclear uh, reactors etc where often there's big machines that forms in circles uh, and then later on also with with circular portals that are just magically uh, a ring uh, of energy or something like that. And they are often the, the most extreme ones. They travel through time or different dimensions. And actually kind of like the way you were mentioning that portals that are just squares often just lead to a different space. And they're often then set in a, in a kind of more recognizable 
environment. Like um, the doors of Doraemon. Um, and then things that are like cabinets, or like vehicles or some kind that you go in and then you come out. Um, sometimes they are used for like time travel because you go inside and you can exit in the same space, but in a different time. Uh, mm. So maybe some observations, but we haven't done that particular one uh, yet of like forms associated to dimension that is folded. Yeah, yeah. but we, we hope to soon make this archive available um, so that uh, other interested people can use the archive and come for to their own like this, conclusions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for that really interesting, great question. And maybe we have time for the last one if uh, anyone's courage is enough. But if not, uh, uh, we are ap approaching towards our uh, small talk and refreshments uh, part. Uh, but just before that, I would like to make a few announcements in Lithuanian. And actually, Lara and Frederick uh, uh, promised to stay with us uh, for a little while and uh, uh, continue this hybrid uh, uh, physical and uh, virtual uh, session. Uh, and uh, and uh, they will be available to talk uh, on this uh, simple phone <laughs> for a well little while. So uh, stay tuned, Lara and Fredrik. But uh, for now, thank you so much. That was super inspiring. And, and uh, thank you. we'll continue shortly. Mm -hmm.